Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today we're continuing uh, in this study of uh, 101 verses that prove the doctrine of that salvation is by faith alone. And uh, today I'm continuing my conversation with Brother Jason Jack. So we've We've gone through, out of 101 verses, I think we've covered uh, five so far. We're on uh, point number six, Philippians 3.9. Before we get started, just uh, any uh, anything you'd like to say? I was just ready to get back in, in this study. It's been a few days, so this is going to be good, I think. All right, and I'm going to, again, i got to copy and paste this into my... Uh, these list of verses don't have the entire verse. It has the address, and then I got to paste it into my uh, Bible gateway. Oh, here it is. Okay, three nine. I already had it pulled up though. Okay, so this is uh, Philippians three, verse nine. And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Uh, I already looked ahead to see how this is phrased in the Amplified, and I'm excited to get into that, but uh, I don't want to jump ahead. Let me ask you to uh, explain that verse to me first from the key uh, the KJV. Yeah, this is Paul. Um, you know, This uh, Philippians, uh, it's uh, it's called an epistle. An epistle. <laughs> I usually like to ask people. Uh, here's a little Bible quiz to see how much you know about the Bible. I had a series of uh, you know simple questions. How many books were in the Bible? Uh, uh, when was it written? And so on. And I'd ask them this question: How many epistles uh, uh, were there? And you know the people who don't study the Bible, they, 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 they think it's referring to apostles. How many apostles? Well, there were 12, 12 of them. 12 of them. And I said, no, there's a difference between an apostle and a, an epistle. <laughs> <laughs> so an epistle is a letter. And uh, uh, much of the New Testament, after the, uh, the four gospel accounts, are letters that um, uh, Paul wrote uh, many of these epistles, Romans through Philemon, as he's, he's, 
established. It's everybody agrees he wrote Romans through Philemon. All those letters he wrote to these churches. Uh, I, I think these are churches. I might be 100% right. I think these are churches he established. And then as he traveled away, he would stay in contact and send him a letter, particularly uh, if he heard there was some problem that he needed to address in the church. Um, and then, of course, John and Peter, uh, they have some epistles, too. So much of the New Testament really is our epistles. Even the book of Acts is actually an epistle. Um, Luke wrote that as to his, his friend, um, well, I forgot the guy's name, Theophilus, Theosophus or something. Uh, he's, 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 uh, so it's uh, a lot of letters. Um, uh, but this one he wrote to this church in Philippi, as you said. Uh, but Paul, to me, one of the main, uh, I would say, uh, distinctions, the main distinction between Paul and the, uh, the other apostles is that he seems to be, his primary mission seems to be um, fighting against uh, people uh, adding religion to the faith. And, and I think that's why, uh, I think it was in Romans we talked about that, the verse where he says, test yourself whether ye be in the faith. And the test, the test is not, are you doing enough religious works to prove you're saved? The test is, are you in the faith? What is your faith? Tell me what you believe about salvation. That's the test. And if, if you answer the, the, the question, uh, I believe that I'm saved because of what Jesus did for me and not because of anything I've contributed to my, to my salvation, then uh, you pass the test. Um, so he has, uh, I think, much of what Paul does, especially in Galatians and uh, he, uh, Hebrews, it's very clear, but here in Romans and here in, this kind of reminds me a little bit of Romans 10.3 that we talked about last time, uh, where it's talking about people who are trying to establish their own righteousness instead of submitting to the righteousness of God. And this is the similar point he's making here in this verse. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. Oh, before I do, I, I didn't finish the point I was making about Paul. Paul's main contribution, I believe, uh, is... is um, he says, I'm going to go a step further. Jesus said, believe on me and you'll be saved. Uh, Peter said it. John said it. They're all telling you, believe on Jesus and you'll be saved. The, the, Jesus, uh, Peter, and John all, was, all talked about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's the message. That's the, the gospel. But Paul's saying, look, every time I start a church and teach them that, the Judaizers are following me wherever I go, and they're going in and to my churches and trying to ruin it by saying, that's not right. Paul's telling you're wrong. You've got to also practice Judaism. And that was one of the big mistakes in the, the first uh, 30 years of, of the church, is that uh, you had, first of all, uh, the first believers were Jews, and, and they thought that Gentiles would not even be part of the church. So it was a shock when Peter preached to Cornelius and Gentiles started getting saved, that was a, quite a controversy. Uh, and then the, the next big uh, issue was, wait a second, uh, you're saying that we don't have to be circumcised, we don't have to follow the laws of Moses, we, we don't have to go to temple worship and do animal sacrifices? Paul says, yeah, you have to get rid of all that. That served its purpose in the past, but it's, it's done away with. Now, if you do that, you're insulting what Jesus did for you. You're saying that yeah, that was not enough. So uh, they're, 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 everybody's agreeing. Uh, I mean, Jesus, John, Peter, and Paul all agree. You're saved by believing in Jesus and his finished work. But Paul has this, I believe, an extra burden. And that is that he has to go around and say, not only are you saved by believing, but don't you dare add anything else to that or you've ruined it. Uh, and so, um, so I'm going to read this now in the Amplified because I think that verse in the Amplified. By the way, I'm, I, I have to say this over and over again because, brother, if you haven't experienced this, um, I'm, I imagine you probably have experienced some persecution because uh, you dare to express some viewpoints on theology and science that uh, is not in the mainstream. And when you do uh, take a position that's, that's unorthodox, uh, you're going to have a lot of people uh, uh, hate you for it. And so I have taken some positions that are uh, out of the mainstream on a few theological subjects. 
And, and one of these is we have a lot of people here on YouTube that are strict, staunch, KJV only uh, believers. And, and I was in that camp for 25 years. And over the last couple of years, I've, I've changed to say, well, uh, I'm gonna, I trust the KGB as my scriptures, it's the word of God, but I want to look at other translations because it might be helpful to me too. So I'm a KJB first, but not only. Uh, but by saying that, there's people who are gonna watch this video right now and immediately condemn me for, for daring to say such a horrible thing. <laughs> Alright, so. In spite of that, here it is, verse 9 in the Amplified. It says, And may be found in him, believing and relying on him, not having any righteousness of my own derived from my obedience to the law and its rituals, but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. <laughs> Sounded up perfectly. Yeah. And, and that's why, to me, my, my second thing I like to look at is the Amplified, because it's like having, I don't know who these Bible scholars are that did the Amplified. Uh, I'd be curious to find out who they are. Um, but um, it, it's kind of like if you and I were uh, writing or uh, reading the Bible and then giving our thoughts, like this, what we're doing right now in this video, we're, we're um, uh, adding our thoughts trying to explain the scriptures and teach what the, the meaning of the, these verses here. And so we're inserting our own thoughts into it, uh, not to replace the scripture, but to expound upon it. And that's what these they're doing with the Amplified. They, they take the scripture and then they insert some more they, to amplify and to help us better understand it. And this verse here, uh, I'm going to read it one, and again in the KJV and then also in the Amplified so we can see the difference and, and see why it's, it's so helpful. The KJV is, and be found in him. Uh, let me see, see. I'm going to read it in the Amplified, that, just that portion. It says, uh, uh, and may be found in him, that is, believing and relying on him. I love the term relying on him. I've, I've said that hundreds of times in my videos, uh, believing in Jesus, having faith in Jesus, uh, tr trusting Jesus for your salvation is, is really relying on him. We're depending on Jesus instead of trying to find, get there to heaven through our own means. We're depending and relying on him. Uh, so before I go on, uh, I'll just, we'll break this down bit by bit here. Uh, how do you like that terminology, believing and relying on him? I think that's, that's so important for somebody to understand. Um, and, you know, when I go out and, you know, witness and, and present the gospel, and, you know, and, and sometimes it's not just strangers, you know, the people that I'm associated with and that know me and are, you know, friends or acquaintances, things like that. And, you know, we're talking and they're like, well, you know, what do you mean believe? How, how do you, you know, do you really believe in all this? You know, or you'll get some type of question that questions, you know, how much faith you need to have, uh, you know, or something like that. And so I try to break it down just like you did, you know. It means just to rely, just to rest in his promise. And, you know, and, and so if they, if they say, well, do you really believe in this? I'm like, I not only believe in it, I'm counting on it. You know, I'm counting on it. And that's, you know, once they sort of realize that, you know, okay, you're, you're counting the blessed, this blessed hope that you have. You're not, you're not only believing in the promise, but you're, you're resting and counting on it that it's coming and, and that you're sure of that. Then that's when it sort of, I think, sinks in with a few of my friends and acquaintances exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like uh, if you, uh, you made a promise to me and uh, I said, are you sure, brother? And you say, Brother Luke, you can count on it. Uh, and, um, well, okay, brother, I have confidence in you. I have confidence that you're going to do what you, you promised. So I think these are other words that, that will, that are, uh, right up, right in, up that alley to, to let us understand what this faith, this believing is. It's, 
relying on Jesus, depending on him, having confidence in him. Uh, what was the word that you used? Um, uh, counting on, counting on, counting on him. Counting on yeah, yeah. Okay, so then the next portion of this verse is, uh, it says, uh, not having mine own righteousness, uh, which is of the law. And then that's the KJV. It says, uh, it says uh, in the Amplified, not having any righteousness of my own derived from my obedience to the law and its rituals. Okay. Your thoughts on that? anything you said, uh, I agree completely, um, especially when I consider that there are um, probably at least a half dozen super important verses that we get in the KJV that we will not get in uh, other translations because they come from a different family tree of, of, uh, of uh, manuscripts. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the KJV is... Uh, um, 
uh, has some verses there, like uh, I think it's uh, 1 John 5, 7. I mix these up sometimes. 1 John 5, 7, I think that uh, God was manifest in the flesh. Um, that's, we, we, we know that in John 3, uh, in, uh, um, in, in John chapter 3, it says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we know that the word is also God and it's Jesus. So we can kind of, we can kind of surmise that it's saying God was made flesh, but it, it says the word was made flesh. So, but the only verse that actually says God was manifest in the flesh is in the KJV, 1 John 5, 7. And there's another one uh, that's so... Or, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I mix yeah. up, and then it's, it's uh, 1 yeah, Timothy 3.16. 3, yeah, and so that one would be, uh, uh, so that, uh, that's the one I just said was 1 Timothy. translation that he was made, you know, instead of God was manifest in the flesh, it was he was manifest. Right, right. So uh, it doesn't give you that power that the KJV gives yeah. you, that, you know, Jesus well, was God, and God was manifest in the flesh. Yeah, so some of them would say, he was manifest in the flesh. Some say Jesus was manifest in the flesh, but the KJV said God was manifest in the flesh. And then uh, the other one um, is uh, uh, there, are th there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And so this is though, that's the best portion of scriptures to, to define what the, the, the Trinity, the, the God is triune, the Godhead. And so uh, there's many other examples we can come up with, uh, but that, that's one of the reasons that I, I treasure the KJV, uh, because it, uh, those verses are so critically important for understanding, and yet we don't find them in, in the, uh, these modern translations. Um, but, oh, I will say this. Uh, we kind of got off the subject here, but I think this is a worthwhile topic, too. Uh, um, I remember reading... Uh, one of my best friends to the Lord probably about 20 years ago. Uh, and um, he came, started coming to my house for my home Bible study. And he's an intelligent guy, but he doesn't really have much of a, a, a high education. So his, his reading level was not real, real high. And, and he wanted to read the Bible, study it, but he just couldn't get the KJV. And someone introduced him, it wasn't me, because I was KJV only, but uh, someone introduced him to uh, uh, the NIV or something, or and then he ended up getting a, a parallel Bible that has four different translations side by side, and he started, and then he became a great Bible stu studier, and, and he, he was read all the time, but he, he couldn't, he wouldn't read it, and he didn't feel he could understand it in the KJV, and my argument to him was, well, if, if I move you right over to, uh, let's say, a part of England where they have to speak this Cockney style of English or something, and you know, I can't, if, when I hear them talking like that, I, it doesn't sound like English to me. I, but if I moved there and spent six months living there, it would sound second nature to me. You know? It's the same thing with uh, the KJV. If you just stick with it, I told him, uh, you know, it'll, it'll uh, gradually, you'll understand it. So, that's what I urge them to do. But, so I think for some people, though, uh, it can be a great help for them to look at some other translations that are written in a, in a style of English that's easier to understand. But I do agree that uh, we need to test everything else by the KJV. Uh, the other thing I was going to get at is, um, uh, I forgot, but maybe I'll remember it again. Let's go on here. Um, <laughs> uh, so now a little further in this, verse 9, it says, uh, uh, But that which is through the faith of Christ, that, that phrase there in the KJV, let's see how it's phrase in the Amplified. Um, but possessing that genuine righteousness, which comes through faith in Christ. Now, there's a big controversy about uh, faith of Christ. And... Uh, I've had some, uh, I've had to make a video about it, and, uh, there are some people that, that, that to me, they, they place such great importance on that phrase, the faith of Christ. And, uh, I'm under the belief that the faith of Christ is not talking about Jesus' faith. 
Now, God doesn't have to have any faith. <laughs> God knows everything. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, God has seen it all. He, he, you know, he doesn't have to have faith like us. Uh, but I'm not going to go off into that because I already made a video on that. I don't want to go again get too sidetracked. But I believe that it's uh, we could uh, this translation of in this says faith in instead of faith of here and the amplified. I don't have an issue with that. But I know there are people that would raise hell over this. Oh no, it says the uh, not having any. Uh, no, it says but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ. Now, we know it is because of our faith in Christ. Uh, now, now, do you think that, that the, the word of instead of in, is that, a, is that a really important thing to you or not? I think in Galatians 2.16, it kind of defines it as phenomenal. You know, if you read Galatians 2.16, it says, No, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. And that's the first part of it. So, you know, anytime you have the word even come after a word or a phrase in the KJV, it's further defining it. And oftentimes those phrases or words are synonymous. And so the faith of Christ, believing in Christ, you know, that's, it, I look at it like, you know, faith or, or belief and repentance and baptism. These are all events that happen simultaneously at your spiritual birthday. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you turn from whatever you are believing in besides Jesus Christ or unbelief to faith towards God, towards Jesus Christ. And at the same time, you're given that Holy Spirit of promise. You're baptized into Christ. It happens all at the same time. And so I sort of look at this the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, very well said. Um, all right, so now the last part of that verse, it says, uh, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And in the Amplified, it praises it. Um, uh, uh, the, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So I, I think that's a fine way of expressing it. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. On the basis of, of our faith. Yeah, and it further defines, you know, to me, Jesus Christ is God, you know. Mm -hmm. um, just before that says, which is through the faith of Christ, the right, and then further expounding on that, the, the righteousness which is of God, I say it. All right, so uh, even though, by the way, you know, we got off subject a couple of times. <laughs> But I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really care. So feel free to go off subject if, if we, if we find us something that is, uh, important to be said. I don't mind turning off. Um, but now that we, when we come back to what is the point of this video, what is the point of this whole series? And we're going through 101 verses that prove we're saved by faith alone with, with no religious works required on our part. And, uh, so in this verse, does it, does it, does it serve that purpose? Uh, and it's clearly telling us that uh, you, it's the righteousness you, you receive from God that's, that's, uh, uh, credited to you based upon your faith in Jesus for your salvation. It's not any righteousness that you achieve on your own through religious works. And that's really what this verse is saying. How, how would you express it in your own words? We'll go to the next one then, and it happens to be the verse you just cited, uh, Romans 3.22, and in the KJV it says, even 
the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Uh, for there is no difference. Well, let me, I better give a little more context here because, uh, um, let me see, I'm going to go 20 through 22. Oops, no, I put 322 to 322. Okay, typo. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think we better get a little more context here. Uh, no, I better go 23. I should just pull up the whole chapter, but it's easier than the way I'm doing this. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read verse 20 through 23. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, which uh, God without the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. Yeah, that last verse 23 is uh, important to get that content, that in the context too. Right. All right, brother. So there is actually every one of those verses is just fantastic. Uh, maybe the other, these other verses are going to actually show up later in our notes here, but, uh, uh, we're focused on verse 22, but on the whole portion 20 through 23 here, just give me your thoughts on that. Jesus Christ. 
of Jesus Christ, um, and it's by faith. It's unto all, then upon all, them that believe. And then it talks about everybody's sin, you know? And that's the whole point, you know? The law shows us our shortcomings, and then, you know, should get us that knowledge of sin to the point where we humble our heart and understand that we can't establish our own right, we can't do it ourselves, that we need God's perfect righteousness, and, and that's what basically he wants you to come to, and he wants you to have a humble heart to acknowledge him um, and understand that he is, that he's a rewarder of them and seek him, um, you know, like it says in Hebrews, and, uh, and then put your trust in him, and that gets you to Jesus Christ every time once you humble your heart and faithfully put your trust in God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, one of the things I'm really happy, and you know, uh, all these years of uh, studying the Bible and then um, interacting with other believers in Bible studies, I've come to the conclusion that uh, if you talk to any person long enough about the scriptures, uh, you're going to always find some areas of disagreement. Um, but it's, it, that would be true even if people were not Christians just talking about life as a whole. Or no one's going to agree on everything. No two people. Um, but um, we, and we don't have to agree on everything. But I, I, I'm happy that you, very happy that you understand that uh, uh, salvation uh, from the garden to the end of time has always been by by uh, faith in God to be our Savior, uh, rather than uh, as these dispensationalists teach that uh, during certain periods of the history of man, God had a different plan and a different means uh, uh, of salvation for these people, and it changed um, some, some say as many as seven times. Uh, God changed his plan, his method of salvation throughout history, and now we're in the church age, so now it's by grace. So uh, that is, a, to me, a horrible uh, false teaching. I'm not going to say it's a damnable heresy, because at least they say now you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. So they're saved, but uh, it's a. Um, I, I'm just happy that you you understand that, and we agree on that. Um, but as, when we talk about this law uh, that here that's cited in this verse, uh, Paul is using this law again, as uh, as he said many times in his writings, that he says, "For by the law is the knowledge of sin," and uh, the law. I was going to say this earlier. Remember, I told you I forgot something. Um, uh, as, as you go through the New Testament and you see the, the problem uh, in the beginning of the church, and this is the point I make in my videos about the book of James and, and my commentary I did on the book of Acts and so on. As I go through the early church history, you see the transition that the church went through. In the very beginning, um, the, the Jewish people uh, thought that the Savior was only for the Jews. Um, they were very prejudiced and actually racist, a, a bigoted against Gentiles. The Jews would not associate with Gentiles. They were dogs. And when Peter went into Cornelius' house, and that was like a horrible thing. He'd be condemned for, for going into a Gentile's house. And then not only that, he told him about Jesus. I mean, that was a huge controversy in the beginning of the church. And, but God revealed to Peter, and then they find that Peter said, well, who am I to challenge God? Am I going to listen to you or to God? Uh, so they finally ex accepted the fact that, wait, uh, God wants the Gentiles to be uh, believe in Jesus too. So that was a, a big change in the beginning of the church. They, they, they thought it was only for Jews. Uh, and then the next big thing was, and this took longer to come about, and that is the, the point that Judaism has to be discarded. It's, and and the, for, the, the, all these things that when I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's talking about the law. Well, what's that mean? It's referencing the, these laws of Moses, and uh, you can see over and over again it cites, uh, the first one was Peter, when he uh, got the vision about the food, and he said, nothing's unclean. God said, nothing's unclean. And so that was the first thing that was done away with. God said, you can eat whatever you want. You don't have to eat kosher. 
And that was a shocking thing because now the dietary laws were sit, were, were thrown up, thrown out. And, and then, then then they're arguing, uh, they're going going around telling the believers, wait a second, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. And so, and Paul says, and it says, no, you don't have to be circumcised. He goes to Jerusalem to get into the big argument in the church about that. And uh, and then uh, there's the argument about what about all the laws of Moses. And then he's arg they argue about, well, what about temple worship and animal sacrifices? All these things were a part of Christianity in the beginning because Christianity was Jewish people following Judaism and then embracing Jesus as the promised Savior. And that they didn't realize that all the Jewish things, as, as it says, rituals. I think in the last verse it talked about rituals and stuff. But all the rituals and the the traditions and the ceremonial things that the Jewish people did, they loved them, but they had to learn that has to be done away with because you cannot uh, split, you cannot divide your faith between Jesus and Judaism. All right. Now, any thoughts on that before I go more back to this verse? Yeah, I think I've summed up well. Okay, so now let's go just to this verse uh, that we're supposed to be talking about. Uh, in the Amplified, it's verse 22, says, This righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all those, Jew or Gentile, uh, that's what the, how the uh, uh, Amplified expresses it, uh, and it says, um, who believe and trust in him and acknowledge him as God's son. There is no distinction since all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God. Um, so, um, I think that expounds upon it, uh, very well. We're taking what we read in the KJV and then, uh, for example, I know that it says here, um, uh, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that them that believe. Uh, so that all is, is really all people, not only the Jewish people. And that, that's how it's expressing it here in the Amplified. It says, uh, uh, for all those Jew and Gentile who believe. So I, I think that's an important thing to be emphasized at that point. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, well, that's when we look at verse 23, uh, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, and to me, the, uh, the Bible says that uh, all glory is for God only. And it says that God has all the glory. He doesn't share his glory. And there's another verse that says Jesus Christ gets the glory. And so uh, you just... Uh, by putting those thoughts together, it's another proof that, hey, well, Jesus has to be God because he is getting the glory that goes only to God. And uh, I look at, it says, come short of the glory of God. I've always taken that to mean that it's a standard that uh, was set, uh, this glorious standard of perfection, that Jesus lived this perfect life and never sinned. Uh, but that, that's a standard that we all fall short of. It says here in the KJV, we all come short of the glory of God. For the glory of God is this perfect perfection. Uh, but when it says, for all have sinned, uh, in this context, it, it could be talking about the, the difference between Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. All, all, all have sinned. But we can also understand it to mean that it's just talking about all people. And no person can ever go before God and say, hey, I never sinned, so I didn't need Jesus. All, all people are, have sinned and need the Savior. Yeah. So again, uh, this verse, and matter of fact, this whole portion, verses 20 through 
23, this whole portion, really emphasizes again that the the reason for the law is to make us understand that we're sinners and we need the Savior and we get the righteousness of God only through uh, Jesus' efforts, not ours. What Jesus did for us is the means of is getting righteousness. And uh, uh, so this certainly serves that purpose that we're, we're talking about in this study that uh, uh, salvation comes by faith alone, in Christ alone. No works are required on our part. Shall we go to the next one? Oh, let me see how much time we've got. I don't, I've lost track of time here. It's uh, we're about 59, I think. Uh, or maybe, maybe shorter. Oh, we, no, we got we got 45 minutes on the video, so we got 15 okay, minutes. Okay, we talked a little bit before, so yeah, yeah. we can do it now. Yeah. yeah, unless you've got uh, time constraint. No, no, no. Okay. Um, All right, so we'll yeah. go to uh, Romans. Um, Romans. Oops. Gosh. Yeah, Romans 8. Okay. And while you're looking at that, I, I'll look at um, online, and when I'm doing my videos, I'll, I'll pull up kingjamesbibleonline.org. I think that's a great resource. You can search. Uh, you can do word search, pretty searches with it. Uh, if you know the, the verse, you can go straight to it pretty easily. Um, but it, I, found, I find it great to, to work search, you know, to get, um, you know, sort of a overall better feel of, of what a word means, you know. Um, and you can see, um, you know, the first time the issue's in the Bible, which is important sometimes, you know, or a lot of the time, mm -hmm. uh, when you do a word study uh, and see how it's framed in that initial context and then, you know, and then look at the other regions of it. So that's what I'm looking at right now. Mm -hmm. uh, when we just go to these verses, I'm just pulling out mm -hmm. the verses on the King James Bible so what, org. King James Bible Online dot org is the name of it. Uh, that uh, capacity is also available through Bible Gateway. Uh, I, I, I sometimes do that, but right now I'm just trying to. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not being that thorough, I guess, but. Uh, that's fine. That be, might be helpful. Uh, so here it is, Romans 8, verses 3 and 4 in the KJV. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So now, uh, this could be a problem verse here, uh, and, uh, and also another proof text, but also a problem text uh, all at the same time here. So uh, let me ask you to expound on those first. Yeah. 
Son in the likeness of simple flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So, God sent his Son not to condemn us, but to condemn sin and death and overcome death. Uh, and then we overcome death through him. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's just my initial thoughts of verse 4 um, that the righteousness of the law, so the, the law is good, you know, I mean it, we we all come to the acknowledgement that the law is good, it's just a matter of does the law gets you to Jesus Christ mm-hmm. um, and fulfill that, you know, because we can't um, so, you know, we find the Savior Jesus Christ, who did fulfill that uh, and overcame, condemned sin in the flesh, overcame death for us, and put our trust in Him, uh, and then, um, and then who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so, basically, you know, the the Holy Spirit that fills all believers. You know, uh, you have the indwelling of the Spirit uh, at the moment of placing your trust in Jesus Christ, believing in him, calling on the name of the Lord, then walk after that spirit. Let that spirit, God's view, because the grace of God is going to make you a much better disciple than your own spirit looking back at the law and trying to do the good things in the law and not do the bad things in the law. So, Trust in God's grace. Let that mature you to be a good disciple. And that's what I've learned with Tom. Um, you know, more than anything, after uh, putting my faith in Jesus Christ and being a believer, you know, that's that's only the first step in a Christian's life, you know. And then it's like that next step, and everybody's on a different step. You know, everybody's in that different journey of discipleship. Now, if you're... If you trusted in God's righteousness and put your faith in Jesus Christ, you know that there's nothing that you can do to lose that. You can't lose your salvation. But some people may not get to the point of ever even having that assurance or using God's grace that is given by the Spirit so that they can do the things that are pleasing to God and and you know, the purpose that God intended them to have in this life, you know, um, to be possible with others and, and lead others to Christ, they're not doing that, you know. And so to walk after the Spirit simply means to use God's grace, use the Spirit that's in you, grace and truth, to go on unto discipleship. And so you can't look at somebody's um, passion and see if they're a believer or not. Because everybody's at a different stage. Uh, somebody may be an immature Christian that have come to the acknowledgement of the truth and put their faith in Jesus Christ, but they may not even read, you know, a complete chapter in the Bible. They're going to be very immature. They're going to, their life's going to be exactly the same the day after as it was the day before when they put their faith in Jesus Christ. So you can't look at that person's ashes, but over time, you know, we're commanded to walk in the spirit and grow as a mature Christian and that comes with developing a good prayer life, delving into the word of God and, and that's the quickest way is to, is to read the Bible um, and then do those other things that, that come with that. And so, you know, I, I, I come against, uh, and sorry to go on a little tangent here, but I just come against somebody that's like, oh, you're not walking in the spirit, that means you're not saved, you know, and they completely twist and misuse that, especially, you know, somebody that would go to the extreme of that and say that they don't sin anymore because they're in the spirit and they're walking after the spirit. They have this sort of similar profession type attitude. Um, you know, my opinion on that, if somebody says that they don't sin anymore, you know, I don't think they've ever come to acknowledgement of the truth. You know, I don't think that the law has ever gotten into Jesus Christ. Because they're still looking at the knowledge of sin, which is by the law. They're still stuck in the law, in my opinion. Um, so anyway, that's, that's sort of my thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. Well, um, this whole chapter needs to be read and understood because a person could uh, really misunderstood this whole chapter. 
I hate to get too sidetracked apart from the verses we're supposed to focus on here. And this is one of the best chapters in the Bible, Romans 8. Yeah, uh, but there's a couple of problem verses here that people misunderstand. And uh, verse, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So a lordshipper could take that and say, See, you, you better be walking... Uh, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And throughout the rest of the chapter, the same point is made over and over again. But it is, it's also saying that, um, it's saying, I think verse two is the key to this though. It says, for the, um, for the law, I'm sorry, for the first part of verse one, there isn't, no, I'm sorry, verse three, the one that we're supposed to be talking about. It says, uh, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. See, that's the whole point. That's, to me, that's the key to this whole understanding of this chapter. He's saying, look, the law, uh, you cannot accomplish this by you, your efforts trying to follow laws. The law is just to tell us it's impossible and we need to rely on God instead. Uh, so that's what it's really telling you. Couldn't, the law couldn't, this could not be accomplished through legalism. That's, that's what you really need to understand here. Uh, but it's also saying that uh, what is a Christian? Uh, to, it defines a Christian as uh, someone who has the Holy Spirit. Let me see. Um, for ye have not received... I don't know. I read ahead. There's some point here where it says... Uh, Well, if you if you go ahead and you find the verse, I just read it and I can't find it in. Uh, okay, yeah, verse verse nine. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, verse nine really defines what is a Christian. A Christian is someone who has the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, dwelling in them. That's really what it is saying there. Now, but how do you get the Spirit of God to dwell in you? You believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside you, brings your spirit to life. You're, uh, you're born again spiritually from above as a new creature, as a child of God. And the Holy Spirit continues dwelling in you, transforming you. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, now we're able to do things that we could not do, uh, trying to follow the law on or through our own efforts. But we never are able to do it perfectly because in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the Corinthians, you're baby Christians. So he says, they're Christians, all right, but you're babes and you're carnal. So here he's saying that this church here, even though you're Christians, you're carnal. So they're still very actively sinning and it's obvious to everybody. And that then Paul says, but even I'm still carnal. Paul admits he's still carnal. So everybody is carnal to a degree. Some are more carnal, some, and then some of it's, it's more, less carnal, and some of it's more secret. They're very carnal, but no, no one can tell because it's all in secret, <laughs> you know? Um, so the point here really that the people need to understand is that, um, uh, this could not be accomplished through the law. But by believing in Jesus, it can be accomplished. We can become spiritual. We can grow in spiritual maturity. But people who think that that means that sin has to be completely out of our lives as a proof that you're uh, you're saved, uh, they're, they're, they don't understand that it's a matter of degrees for our whole life. Uh, some of us are going to mature quite a bit. Some of us don't mature very much. Some mature slowly. Some mature quickly. And so uh, trying to impose a rigid test on everybody is a big mistake. And people need to look in the mirror before they start judging other people's. Uh, uh, all right. So that's a really, to me, the verse three and four is what we're supposed to be using here as the, to support the faith alone. Uh, let's read that in the, I'm going to read these first four verses in the Amplified. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. No guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior, for the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ, the law of our new being, 
has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, that is, overcome sin and remove its penalty, its power, being weakened by the flesh, man's nature without the Holy Spirit, God did. He sent his son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. He subdued it and overcame it in the person of his own son, so that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not live our lives in the ways of the flesh, guided by worldliness and our sinful nature, but live our lives in the ways of the Spirit, guided by his power. But what we need to understand is even though that's true, we never do it perfectly. Okay? Amen. Yes. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you, getting back to this KJV question, when I read this the very first time, verse 3, look, brother, you're a highly educated person. You, you're a doctor. You're, so you've gone through 12 years of school and then college and then uh, doctors, uh, all that extended education. And I'm an educated person. Uh, at least I have a high school and a college d degree in education. So I'm not, I'm not some person that should not be able to easily understand this. And yet, even with my level of education, I read verse 3 and I didn't get it. In the very beginning, I mean, as we discuss it more and more, I'm understanding it. But verse 3 says, For what the law could not do, in that it, it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walked... In. Well, I tell you, as I read that the first few times in, in this discussion, I really wasn't following it. And, but when I looked at it in the Amplified, it really was very, very clear. So to me, that's just an illustration. It just showed me personally how it was helpful to me to read it in a, in a, a language that is contemporary with insertions from teachers uh, that uh, was, was helpful to me in my understanding.
people use and, and, and understand that it's talking about Jesus' righteousness, God's righteousness, and it's not our righteousness, you know, like this verse here. Um, you know, that's the book of Hebrews, worship salvation will use that whole book, and it, it means that they use it in exactly the opposite context, context of what it was intended for. It was intended to show not to get back under the law and to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ and to mature in the spirit like we see here and, you know, rest and have that assurance and that peace and that joy and not get back under the law. But don't use it just the opposite. And so, um, you know, I think that's a good point that can come out on this verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, to me, the the main thing to get out of this verse here says, verse 3, for what the law could not do. That's the real point that we were trying to emphasize, is the law cannot accomplish uh, salvation. Um, whether we refer to it as the law, uh, or uh, religion, uh, or uh, works, uh, it's all the same thing. It's man's effort to uh, make himself acceptable to God. And uh, we cannot do that. Uh, we, we need to understand that that's impossible. That's why we need the Savior. And so that's where this verse is, is uh, the most important thing we find in this verse, I think. It says the law could not do it. It could not be done through the law. Um, now, one last thing. Uh, I got a call a few days ago from a, a young believer I haven't spoken to for quite a while. and We were catching up. and uh, we we're he started talking about sin and some struggles he was having. And, and I, I think that um, it's important for everybody to keep in mind that um, there's, a, um, there's a video, one of my all-time favorite videos on YouTube. It was made by um, uh, Street Preacher 1611 is the uh, name of this channel. And he made a video titled uh, Standing in State. And it's an animated video, so find that video. But it's 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 uh, it's really good. What makes this point is that the standing that we have before God is righteous. Uh, we're in good standing, and that cannot change no matter what. Uh, but the state at any given moment varies between you know how well we're we're walking in the spirit or in the flesh. So our 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 state is always changing, but our standing cannot change. So in that way, we're sinlessly perfect in our standing, but in our state, <laughs> we're, we're sinning to varying degrees, everybody. Uh, so I was telling the young man, I said, you know, don't be too hard on yourself because, you know, um, uh, if I asked you, well, how much are you sinning now? Uh, really, uh, and, and without being uh, acting like I'm one of these sinless perfection uh, advocates, that, oh, I don't sin anymore. Um uh, that's a big mistake to think that uh, we don't sin anymore when we put our faith in Jesus. And if you do have any sin in your life, you didn't really get saved. That's blasphemous, damnable heresy. But on the other hand, to be too hard on ourselves, and we should be able to recognize that, look, the Holy Spirit has transformed us. Uh, it's been uh, since December of 1986. What's that? 30, almost 31 years. I've had the Holy Spirit working on me. <laughs> And I'm a different person. Anybody who's known me over these years, they will clearly say he's different than he used to be. His, and, and it can be demonstrated with my interests, my habits uh, are totally different than they used to be. Um, a lot of the things I, I was interested in many years ago, uh, it's, I, I should be in prison for the things I was interested in doing. And, and, and so uh, I know that I'm not sinning like I did. But on the other hand, I know that I'm still not perfect. Sometimes I lose my patience. Sometimes I get angry. Sometimes I, I don't know. I, I can make confessions right now, but I know that. But on the other hand, I, the Holy Spirit has made great progress in transforming me too. So I was telling the young man, look at your life. I, you know, from what I know about you, you're, you're doing a very good job in, in, in terms of walking in the spirit instead of in the flesh. But no, you, you're not perfect. <laughs> yeah. I agree, you know, I mean, my, my life's changed since being a believer, but it's not, 
you know, looking at how much a little I feel. I don't even look at it like that, you know. It's, it's, um, but I think others would, would say, you know, that they've seen a change, obviously, you know. Without the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, do the things that, you know, I'm beginning to do. And hopefully, you know, I'm just getting started, uh, God willing. But, you know, there, there will be a change over time. But then if you look at any one moment in time, you know, if you have a bad day, if I have a bad day and I come home and I'm not the friendliest person, you know, if you had a, a camera in, in my house, you know, you couldn't tell if I was saved or not, you know? Uh, and that goes for anybody, if we're honest with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, totally agree with your point. Mm-hmm. All right, well, we've gone a little bit more than the hour that we I want, I want to allocate. So it's an hour and ten minutes. Let's let's sum this up now. Uh, could you give me, like, a, a summary thoughts for the study? doctrine that uh, we're, we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, these verses here uh, support that and reinforce it, uh, and yet we know that uh, once we get saved, um, there's still going to be this question about between how we walk in the flesh or in the spirit, and uh, uh, but that should not be an indicator of whether we're saved, but it's just a question of how how well we're doing uh, with that Holy Spirit. Are we agreeing with it? Are we embracing the promptings and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit? If we embrace it, we change more, we mature more. If we resist it, and the Bible says that we resist the, the Spirit and we grieve the Spirit and even we quench the Spirit. And I think that might be, quench might mean that Gosh, you just ignored the Holy Spirit so long, but pretty soon you've kind of like tuned it out. You don't even you don't even listen to it at all anymore. You know? Yeah, and I mean, or or grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, all those are um, things that you know that doesn't mean that the person lost it, or you know they lost their salvation by any means. You know, or you're sealed and secured. You know, the Spirit is you know the earnest. Uh, of your redemption, you know, and, and um, it's it's not that you lose it, but if you don't walk in the spirit, you're you're just not going to be a good disciple, you know. It, it's not a matter of how once you have the spirit, you have the spirit, you know. I mean, you you have been baptized into the body of Christ, you know, through faith alone in Jesus Christ, and you repented from you know, dead works or unbelief or anything else to holding you to a, the acknowledgement of the truth and you repented towards or turned to God and Jesus Christ for salvation and that all comes together, you know, through through faith and um, and then after that, then you should walk in the spirit that you have as a believer, but that is all discipleship. So don't ever, you know, just viewers, you know, listeners, don't ever muddy the gospel and mix salvation and discipleship. Because, you know, salvation in the moment in time is, again, it's your spiritual birthday. Once you place your faith alone in Jesus Christ and call upon the name of the Lord and trust in Him and His finished work, that He died for your 
sins and overcame death through you, through his resurrection, you are saved and sealed. But they go on to gain that assurance and know that you have eternal life, as it says in First John five thirteen. And that comes over time, being a disciple, walking in the Spirit, doing the things we talked about. Um, and, it's a, and that's a lifelong process. Salvation is not a process. But discipleship is a lifelong process. So sometimes we get it, and sometimes it's not. Uh, you know, and, and, and that goes, you know, over time. But like you said, your life 30 years ago compared to your life now is completely different. You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because you've matured in the faith. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've examined yourself <laughs> to see if you're in the faith. And continually over time, you've rested in your faith in Jesus Christ and that he died for your sins and, and overcame death for you through his resurrection and that has given you that that has filled you you know his spirit in you to go on and to do those things that are pleasing to him and be profitable to others you know, you know I mean your many shorter last nine years has been amazing on, on YouTube and I could even have a hint of what you've done you know, you're bring the surface, I'll, I'll think of my ministry as a success. Uh, but, you know, you're showing, uh, you're showing a, a great example of what it means to walk out through the Spirit. And it's by preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ and telling others of Jesus Christ uh, through your evangelism and through your ministry. And then, you know, be profitable to others. Be profitable to others. And, you know, in your words and deeds and your actions. And you're not perfect, you know, and I'm not perfect either. And we sin and, you know, and if, if we truly, you know, want to calculate it, we can say we sin every day. Um, but we're still a child of God and we're still walking in the Spirit as a disciple uh, of Christ. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I guess that's a good way to finish it. Mm-hmm. Uh, All right, brother. I, uh, I enjoyed this as usual. I look forward to next time. So as soon as your schedule opens up, let's let's talk about some more of these verses. Uh, and uh, to the viewers, uh, thank you for watching. And more than anything else, I hope you'll understand now that uh, tr- trying to get to heaven through your uh, own efforts by making yourself acceptable to God uh, is, is doomed to failure. And you need to, need to understand that you've got to instead uh, just put your faith completely in the Savior. That's why we need to be saved, because um, trying to get to heaven on our own efforts is impossible. So, uh, as uh, Brother uh, Jason said, call on the name of the Lord, rely on Jesus Christ, um, believe that he died for your sins and you're going to go to heaven. Have confidence in his promise of eternal life, and uh, you're assured of it. Thank you for watching. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.